Um, well, great to be with you. I just wanted to uh, say thank you all so much for your kindness, your warm uh, hospitality, your welcoming uh, towards me and my entire family as uh, we are joining to be a part of what God's doing here at CFC. Uh, last um, week, we announced that we were going to be starting a brand new ser sermon series uh, called Did Jesus Actually Say That? And uh, we decided we're going to push that and start that next Sunday. So Greg will be back with us next Sunday. Um, so something to look forward to. We're going to be actually looking at some of the most provocative, scandalous things, if you will, that Jesus said. And we're going to be like, did he really say that? What in the world does he mean by that? So it's going to be a great Sunday to invite somebody and join us as we launch that new uh, sermon series next week. Well, how many people survived their first week back at school? All the students? Actually, really, the parents. Parents, did you survive? Now, I know for some of you that are the homeschool families, you probably started homeschooling like in July or something because you're, you know, you're important. But uh, a lot of people went back and they started this this week. And here's what it means as a parent. So uh, my wife and I, we have four kids. We have a 21-year-old, 18, 12, and 11. So we have two in kind of the college season of life, and then we have two in middle school. So for the first time, we don't have anyone in high school for, for a little bit. And you get the famous syllabus, and they all come home. Every class has one, and parents are to go over the syllabus with their kids, and you have to sign them. The students need to sign them as a way of proving that you actually understand what this class is about. And that's really what a syllabus is, is designed to do, to tell you, hey, uh, newsflash, this is the class you're taking, and this is what this class is ultimately about. It gives you the goal of the class, it, and it lists all the objectives of the class. And so last week, Greg shared with us an incredible message. And if you weren't able to watch it online or you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go to our website, uh, ChristFC.org, and watch the message or listen to the message that Greg gave as he it challenged us. And he's really been doing an amazing job leading us all summer long in kind of giving us these short little vision videos that have been emailed out to you. And if you're not a part of that, go to the website and you can sign up to receive those kinds of things. And it's a way for us to say, where are we going? What's our syllabus? As a church, as a faith community, what's our syllabus? And there are many goals and many objectives and lots of things that we want to do. But as, as a church, we have one ultimate primary goal. We call it our mission. And our mission is simply this. Our goal is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you've been a part of this congregation or you've kind of grown up in church you know you've heard versions of that 10,000 different ways it's really taken from from the words of Jesus in the end of Matthew's gospel where he says to, to make disciples of all peoples and you do that by going and baptizing and teaching them to obey all that he's commanded so if you've kind of grown up in the church world you're like yeah I got it and it's it's kind of like after you've been a student for a while and you get the syllabus you're like you just sign it I, I know it's it's I got it got to read this stuff got to do this stuff here's the quizzes here's the breakdown you got it if you're new to school you might want to really pay attention to the syllabus and so if you're visiting with us and maybe maybe a friend invited and you're not even sure what you really think about church or Christianity you're kind of like so this is what they're about leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and you're like what in the world does that mean but here's what I know to be true for those of us that would say I have a relationship with Jesus we're very quick to affirm, yep, that's what we do. That's what we want to do. We want to love people, and we want to share with them the one who's changed our lives. Except it's much more shocking than that. Because this sounds really nice when you're gathered in church, and we can all nod our heads and go, that's right, amen, preach it, brother. It's another thing when you actually start to have friends, coworkers, neighbors teachers students and you don't like them they're difficult they're challenging and we start kind of having lines if you will we're like yeah I, I like to share my faith I like to introduce somebody to, to to what it means to have a relationship with Jesus but then you have to interact with that person and maybe they're not very nice to you and then all of a sudden it's kind of like you know what I'm not sure that I want to to do this exactly and we start to form a little line a barrier and we're kind of like um yeah would you like to come to church but there's part of us that are like 
you know, the things that people believe, the way people that live, the ideologies that they embrace, and we get scared, and we're kind of like, I'm just going to kind of stay on this line. And then there's, then there's other people, and maybe they're, they're really nice, you like them. And that maybe they're even a really, you're like, you love their values. You agree with them on all kinds of things. But there's still this sense of, well, I don't know how they feel about Jesus, and I'm not sure how to connect with them and relate to them. And maybe you don't have as big of a line. You just have a, a little line. And you put it down, and before you know it, in the church world, you're in a box. Because there's a lot of people out this way, and there's a lot of people out this way, and you're not really sure how to relate, how to connect. What do they think of you? What do you think of them? And your world can become really small. And that, let me just tell you, I've been a pastor for 27 years. I've been a Christian for many, many years. And the longer you've been in the church world and, and you talk about our mission is to have people lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus, you don't realize it. But your world gets actually smaller and smaller and smaller. And you take the mission about helping people have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, and you go, okay, I know how I'm going to do that. I'm going to help people have a growing relationship with Jesus inside the box. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll help you. And you're like, yeah, we're doing this mission thing. And you know, there's a real part about teaching people to obey Jesus in all things means we keep growing in our faith, absolutely. But let's not miss the obvious statement. There are lots of people outside of these lines. And the whole point of Christianity is to introduce a world to a God that made them, a God that loves them and invites them into not a religion but a relationship. And that means you're going to have to go outside the lines. You're going to go, have to go outside of the box. And that's where a mission statement starts to feel a little more uncomfortable. Feels a little bit more, a little more shocking. And so the title of the talk today is A Shocking Mission. And we're going to look at an account in Luke chapter 19. And if you've grown up in church, you know the story really well. But I want us to lean into this and feel how crazy this is. How shocking, how, how scandalous. As we get ready for next week's sermon series, did Jesus say that? There's a sense in which we're going to ask, did Jesus say that? Did Jesus do that? And if you've never heard this story before, man, I hope it speaks to you in a powerful way. Dr. Luke, he was a physician, and he began a relationship with Jesus, and he wrote an orderly account so that people would know this is who Jesus is. This is what he did. This is what he said. This is why he came. And this makes up one of our four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. So Luke is recording these things. And what Luke does in Luke chapter 19, he gives us one of the last shocking public encounters that Jesus has right before he enters Jerusalem to go to the cross, to die, and then to rise on the third day. So let's look at this passage together, beginning in verse 1. He, that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Notice Jesus enters a place called Jericho, and Jericho was a beautiful place. Perfect climate, palm trees families would be out playing on the streets had palms rose it was a beautiful place and it had along the streets these sycamore trees and people get word that jesus is coming he's entering jericho and the crowds just gather and we're told this interesting word it says and behold this is luke's way of saying this is what i want you to zoom in on this is, this is the target. I want you to fix your eyes on what's about to take place. Behold. In the Greek, it's a word that calls for great attention, to see with intensity, to look carefully. And we're introduced to this person named Zacchaeus. Now, the irony of the name Zacchaeus, it means clean one, pure one, righteous one. And as we're going to see, he's anything 
like that in the way he lives his life. We're told he is a chief tax collector. So he's not just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. He's like like the CEO of the tax collectors. He has a group of people working for him. Zacchaeus is what we might call a white-collared thief. He's a respectable person, but he's a hated person. He's a person of, of status, and yet he's despised because he robs. He takes advantage of people. In ancient Palestine, uh, tax collectors were hated people because basically they were Jewish people that were working for the Roman government. So you're viewed as a traitor right there. And what Rome would do is they would set up these tax posts. The closest thing that we might kind of think of it, uh, don't so much think about paying like your income tax, think of it more like tolls. If you ever ri- driven up uh, Route 95 going north, like towards New Jersey or New York, you know, you pay about $6,000 in tolls. You go up and you're like, hey, that'll be $8, that'll be $6, that'll be $4. And you're like, wow. Imagine if you kept stopping at a toll to get to the next bridge or the next section of the road, and the toll person was like, oh, that'll be 20 And you're like, wait a minute, I just drove here yesterday and it was 10 Yeah, well, it's 20 today. And they keep changing the price. And you know why. Because that Jewish person, which is your own, that's your own, that's one of your peeps, right? They're working for Rome. And what Rome would do is they would set up a price, which already was high. And then the tax collectors would say, uh, well, as long as we give Rome what they're requiring, um, we're going to take a little profit ourselves. We want a tip. And if you're the chief tax collector, even the tax collectors don't like you. You know why? Because you're taking a bigger cut than they are. So if Rome wants $8, the chief tax collector says, well, you can take 10, but actually uh, make it 15. You can take the 10 and I'll take the extra five. Do you see how hated Zacchaeus would have been? Because everyone around knew it's him. And what I, I love about this story, which is so provocative, is it tells us little details. And Luke loves details. He says, and he was rich. You know what he throws that in? How did he get rich? By taking advantage of his own people. That's exactly right. Amen and doll, they're the same thing in church. This is awesome. That's right. He's rich because he's abusing his privilege, his power, his authority. And no one in all of Jericho would have wanted to identify with Zacchaeus. No one would have been a fan or a friend of this individual. He would have been considered an outlaw and an outcast. Now, let's just get real for a moment because remember we talked about mission of our church is we want to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ which sounds really nice and spiritual until you realize that means you want to lead people like Zacchaeus people maybe outside your line outside of our box do you want to sit next to a Zacchaeus who has been ripping you off all week when your finances were already tight you want to invite Zacchaeus to your small group do you want to hang out with him and have a cup of coffee in the commons after the gathering? Hey, so how many people are going to take advantage of this week, guys? You know, I have a feeling if we're honest, we're like, yeah, I'll, I want to lead Zacchaeus into a growing relationship with Jesus. I want to knock his lights out so hard that he meets Jesus. That's what I want to do. Because he's considered an outlaw and an outcast. No one's a fan and no one's a friend of this person. And I was thinking about when I read the Bible, sometimes I have these images come into my mind about like the Bible paints pictures with words. And I was thinking if I was like a a movie director, uh, which would be a really fun job, who would I cast to be Zacchaeus if we were going to make this a picture? And the first person that came to my mind was uh, Danny DeVito. (laughs) Because it says he was a short man in stature. I mean, he's this slimy human being. And all I'm sure Danny DeVito is a wonderful person in real life, but all his characters, if you remember Taxi from the early 80s, I mean, just Louis de Palmer, slimy guy. And I thought, well, okay, if I couldn't get Danny DeVito, then I think I would get this guy. I'd get Wayne Knight, who played, he's played many roles, but, but Newman on Seinfeld. Hello, Zacchaeus. Just, just short little slimy human beings that's the kind of characters that that often they've played in different roles that they've had and and that's the i I don't know if if zacchaeus probably looked like any of that but i want you to have some visual in mind this is not a guy you would have wanted to hang out with he was a despised person and yet verse 4 of luke tells us this 
So he ran on ahead. This is Zacchaeus. He climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now, this to me is a a strange thing, because here you have a person with high position, high status, even though he's hated, he has a lot of money, and he's running, and he's climbing a sycamore tree so that he can see Jesus. And this is what a sycamore tree would have looked like. And you could see they'd be pretty easy to climb up because they're pretty low and you just kind of work your way up. Luke never tells us why he wanted to do this. But understand how strange this would be. Imagine a a politician that's well known. Someone in a high office, a CEO. Someone, uh, owner of a bank or or a president of of a university. Imagine them climbing a tree. And everybody knows who they are. Like, the kids climb the trees, not, not chief tax collectors. And Luke never tells us why he wants to climb the tree. All it says is he wants to get a look at Jesus. Why? Well, perhaps it's just he wants to see the famous Jesus. He's the talk of everywhere. And he, he just wants a moment to get caught up to say, yep, I saw him. Or perhaps Zacchaeus is the classic person who is successful by every standard, has plenty of money, and yet he's miserable because at the end of the day he has to look at himself and realize I feel so empty I'm hated by people but what they don't know I even hate me and maybe he's he's heard some things about Jesus you know in Luke's gospel tax collectors are mentioned six times and in all six times it's a positive encounter and Luke captures some of these perhaps he heard in Luke chapter 5 that there was this guy named Levi. Perhaps he knew Levi. Because Levi, who we know is Matthew, was a tax collector. And Jesus has an encounter with him. And Levi leaves everything and follows Jesus, becomes a disciple, begins a growing relationship with Jesus. And Levi throws a giant party and he invites all of his tax uh, gather collectors to come. And guess who shows up to hang at the party? Jesus. And all the religious people are like, why would he this religious rabbi hang out with those sinners maybe heard about that and was like is this is this someone who actually knowing what i do would accept me somehow on some basis or maybe he heard about the parable the story that luke records in just the previous chapter luke 18 of the pharisee who prays and the tax collector who prays and Jesus said the Pharisee prays this prayer. He goes, thank you that I'm, I'm not a thief. I, I'm not an adulterer. Thank you that I'm not like the tax collector. And I thank you that I get to do all these wonderful things. I give a portion of my money away to the poor. And then Jesus says, and then there's the tax collector praying in the temple. He doesn't even look up. He looks down. He just beats his chest and he just says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, you know who went away right with God, justified before God? It's the tax collector. That would be like, think about it, that would be like if I stood up here and said, you know who's really right with God? It's not Pastor Greg Dutcher. It's the drunk over there. You'd be like, it's crazy. How dare he say something like that? That's the point of Jesus' story. See, Christianity doesn't distinguish between good and bad. You know what it distinguishes? Between proud and humble. People who put their trust in themselves and people that realize, I need someone else to help me. And they turn, ultimately, to Christ. We're never told why, but here's what's more important. It's not so much that Zacchaeus is interested in seeing Jesus. What is shocking about this is that Jesus wants to see Zacchaeus. Out of all those people gathered, he wants to single out Zacchaeus. And so we read in verse 5, it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I can't help but to wonder, when Jesus yelled out his name, if Zacchaeus almost fell out of the tree. Uh, Imagine if and maybe this is you you somebody invited you to church you came to church today and you're like i just i'm just hanging in the back row just 
leave me alone. Don't want to talk to anybody. Just checking this thing out. It's all a little weird anyway. You just want to get in and get out. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the sermon, I called out your name and said, hey, you, come on. Come on down. Would you not be, like, freaked out? The whole reason he's up in a tree from a distance is he wants to see things from a distance. And Jesus is like, Zacchaeus, you're on heaven's radar. Jesus knows his name. He doesn't say, hey, you, short man up there, creepy guy that nobody likes, heard some things about you. He calls him by his name. He doesn't call him a name. He calls him by his name. And he invites him with a word of command, come down. And then he says something. I want to stay at your house. Except Luke uses a Greek word. He uses this word, I must stay at your house. It's the same word that he uses in his gospel when Jesus says things like, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, suffer and die and rise on the third day. Must. There's no other option. And Luke says, Jesus says to creepy, outlaw, outcast Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house. Now, now don't get all like, WWJD, what would Jesus do and misapply this? Do not apply that the same way in our culture today. Hey, I'm coming to your house today for lunch. That will not be an expression of hospitality. That will be weird and people won't like that. But in this culture, this was so astonishing. Do you know why? It was a sign of great honor. To invite, to be in someone's home was a, a place of status. It not only reflected on you, but it made a loud statement about them. So when Jesus says this, don't hear it kind of in our, our, our American culture today. We're like, that's why would he invite himself to somebody's house? Hey, I'm coming to you. Hope you make a good dinner. This is Jesus saying, I know you're an outlaw and outcast, but I want to hang with you. I want to spend time with you. And one of the things that, that Greg, in one of the, the vision videos that he sent out, he talked about this idea of belonging before believing. Unless you think that's just some kind of gimmicky little thing, I want you to know that's exactly what you see in the text here. That's exactly what Jesus does. Zacchaeus, come down, I must stay at your house. Zacchaeus is still a chief tax collector. Nothing has changed. He's not had a conversation about, yeah, you need to go to the synagogue. We need to get you to church. He says, no, I just want to spend time with you. The safest place you could be with another person is your home, on your turf. That's belonging. Notice what eventually follows, believing. It says he came down and received him joyfully. He welcomes, okay, Jesus, yes. Belonging came before believing. That's really important. If our goal is to help people, lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, there's a sense in our church People need to feel like they can belong while they check out the gospel of Jesus Christ as they kind of, at their pace, consider truths. And it's a safe place for them to belong before they believe. And Jesus does this. He models it perfectly. And notice what he says. He says, come down, come down. You know, every human religion, human philosophy is all about go up, climb the tree, climb the tree. Climb it up higher, get successful. Climb, no, you got to go more to the left. No, you got to go more to the right. No, you got to be a moderate, be in the middle. Climb, 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 climb. Get ahead, get ahead, get ahead. Help yourself, improve yourself, make a way for yourself, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Climb, climb, climb. And Jesus says, No, that's not why I came. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about come down. Humble yourself and come down. Come as you are. You don't need to clean up anything. You don't need to improve anything. You know, the purpose of taking a shower is you don't clean yourself up before you get in the shower. The shower is for that purpose. And Jesus says, look, I understand you're a mess. And that doesn't scare me. I want to spend time with you. Belonging that he might come into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, believing. But notice the response of everybody around. Look at verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. They're outraged. Jesus, why don't you invite him to church? Don't, 
You don't enter. Do you understand to enter a tax collector's home was to make you ceremonially unclean? They're an outcast. They're an outlaw. You don't do that. If Jesus, if you're a holy person, you should know better. None of the other religious leaders would even give this guy a time of day. And you're, you're like, I, I'm singling you out. Out of everybody, I want to spend time with you. Is that not shocking? Does that not provoke us to go, wow, I, I don't know how comfortable I am. That almost makes me a little uncomfortable. Because if we're going to follow Jesus in that mission, guess what? That becomes our mission. And by the way, Jesus isn't watering anything down. He's not going, quote, unquote, Christian light. <laughs> he's committed to the scriptures. But he's committed to the heart of his father that those scriptures point to. And he says, I'm coming to your house. I want you. And you know, I was thinking about this week, <laughs> the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament, is just a collection of, of broken humanity even the great quote unquote heroes of the Bible the people that we often quote or know people like Noah he built that ark he's a righteous person well Noah got drunk or, or we say well Abraham oh father of many nations important guy yeah well you know what not once but twice he put his wife in the most vulnerable compromising situation sexually to save his own neck Jacob God loves Jacob but Jacob was a chronic deceiver and liar what his name actually means king david the one that the messiah will come from yeah he was a man after god's own heart but he was also a person that abused his position of authority took advantage of a woman who was someone else's wife committed adultery and then to cover his own tail had her husband killed and to make it look like an act of war and didn't come clean about it on his own he was confronted by the prophet nathan God had to confront him. He was looking as a way to get, get around it and cover it all up so nobody would know. Solomon, his, one of his sons, he, was, he, he wrote a lot of Proverbs. Wisest person to ever live besides Jesus. He was a womanizer. He didn't take his own wisdom towards the end of his life. Rahab, she's a prostitute. And we haven't even started on the New Testament like Jesus' disciples, like one of his lead guys, Peter. Would you want one of your pastors, one of your leaders, just a month ago to deny the faith? Do you feel good about that? They have no business preaching. Well, that's what Jesus, that's what Peter did. Not once, not twice, three times. He denies Jesus. He denies I even know him. The very thing Jesus said he would do, and he denied and said, I'll never do that. I'll even die with you. And he denies him. And you know what? Jesus, in a short period of time, restores him. And about a month later, there's the day of Pentecost. And Jesus appoints him, you're going to preach this message. And 3,000 people become followers of Jesus through a man that just about a month, month and a half ago was denying he even knew Jesus. It's interesting, in the church world, we wouldn't have it, but apparently Jesus has different thoughts. Because he's doing something in the lives of outcasts, outlaws, broken people. Because that's the whole point of Christianity. Christianity is for bad people, for broken people, for hypocrites, for mean, nasty people. That's the whole point of Christianity. The Christianity is not about being bad and trying to improve to get a little bit better. Christianity is about coming face to face with I'm spiritually dead and I need to become spiritually alive and I can't do that. I need Jesus to do that. That's growing relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I, I was pondering this question, and I'll just throw it out to you. I'm wondering if I am comfortable. I kind of know the answer. If I'm really comfortable with being accused by other people, why is that guy hanging out with that person? Do you, does he not know what they believe? How they live? Their lifestyle? I, I, I'm just wondering if CFC would be willing to be occasionally accused of, can't believe they did that. Because our heart is beating with the heart of Jesus who came for broken people. And we haven't forgotten we're still broke. But every day he's making us new. New and new. He writes a new name over our story. And because he alone does that by shocking, scandalous grace, we look with that lens through the eyes of other broken people, those other quote-unquote outcasts and outlaws because that was us and it still is us in an experiential way, but positionally we're made new. Look at what it says in verse 8. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. How crazy is this? When did Jesus have the conversation about his stealing issues? When did Jesus even bring up the money? Here's what he did. Jesus invited himself into this man's home. And all we're told is Zacchaeus said, I welcome you. I receive you. I can't believe you would want to come, enter my life, enter my home. And here's what Jesus does when he enters our home, enters our lives. He starts to rearrange some of the furniture. Starts to put some renovation projects. Reconstruction starts to happen. For, for some of you, when you gave your life to Jesus, there were some things that just changed instantly. It was like an instant makeover in that room. But isn't it true? Most areas of your life, you feel like you're living in a constant renovation. I kind of, Jesus, can you just please, like this is not a good area of my life. Can you please fix it? This would honor you if you would just heal me of this or deliver me of this, help me. And Jesus says, oh, I'm helping you. And I am making you more like me every day, but I'm okay with the mess. But I want to paint. I want to make it shiny. Oh, you're going to be shiny, all right, but just not yet. You're shining my eyes. Experientially, you will experience that shine ultimately when you're with me in glory. Jesus is comfortable with the mess. He's comfortable with all those realities. And here's what I love. The robber, the thief, he becomes a giver. Why? Because the furniture in his life got changed. And when you give your life to Jesus... Jesus starts from the inside out. Religion is always from the outside in. Religion will always say, well, here, here's the line. Here's the line. You need to kind of fix this or you need to change this before you can come in. But Jesus says, no, I, I go out. I always step out of the reality. I always step out of that line. And then he says these incredible words in Luke 19. Verse 9. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house you know what's shocking about that it doesn't say that salvation came in the church or in his case the synagogue or on the, at a bible study it came at the outcast outlaw's home on his sinful turf because that's what the mission is always about doing being for people that are yet to come to know the God of hope. Salvation comes to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. This is Jesus' way of saying, welcome outsider and outlaw into the family of God. You're a son of God. And that's what he says to all who place their trust in Christ. You're a son, you're a daughter now of the king. Unless you just think this is a, a cool story about some guy, Zacchaeus, that lived a long time ago, I want you to know Jesus sums up his whole mission. The, the big syllabus of why the church exists today on planet earth. It's right here. You want to know what is Christianity really about? Matt, could you just give me a one sentence phrase? Here it is, verse 10. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was seeking out Zacchaeus. Can I just say, I, I don't know why you decided to come to church or those of you that are watching online, why you decided to, to, to lay in bed or, or at the sofa and just kind of say, I'll check this CFC thing online. But I know this, there's a seeking Savior. And you actually are on heaven's radar. He knows your name. He knows all about you. Yes, he even knows that. He knows the mess. He knows the hypocrisy. He knows what you don't want anyone else to know because you would be humiliated if they knew. He knows all of that. And he wants to call your name. And he wants to move into your home, to your heart, to your life. And oh yeah, when you invite him in, he will start rearranging things. He's going to say, yeah, you know, we're going to get rid of that. That, that chair is nasty. We got it. And it's going to happen on his timetable. But make no mistake about it, when, when you receive Christ, he takes over. It might not feel quick, but he's always, as we were singing earlier in that great song, Waymaker, he's always at work, whether we're feeling it, sensing it. He is at work in our lives, and he changes people because he 
is the savior that seeks and he is not just the seeking savior he has the power to actually save here's the takeaway i want us to get today jesus not only seeks out outsiders and outlaws but he saves them i wonder if you would be honest to identify maybe not by your standards maybe not by other people's standards but by a god that's perfect and holy yeah, if we want to use his standard, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an outlaw. I've broken God's commands. I haven't loved him perfectly. I haven't loved my neighbor perfectly. Just ask any of my family. They know that. You know what? I am an outsider. Oh, I work real hard to try to be a cool one inside or with the kids at school and at the lunch table. But, but when it comes to actually knowing the God who made me, I, I'm not so sure I'm an insider. I feel like I'm on the out. And the whole point of Christianity is God loves outsiders. He loves outlaws. And he invites them to welcome him into their lives, to receive him by faith so that they become new. They become a part of a family. They become a part of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, these lines, Jesus wasn't a revolutionary. If I can have the worship team come and the ushers, if you can begin to get ready to pass out the elements Jesus is not just a revolutionary. We're like, that's really cool. Like everybody else wanted to, they, they want to stay in the box, but Jesus was willing to go outside the lines. That, that, that's true. He did that. But Jesus and Jesus alone is the only one who has lived the perfectly straight and narrow path. He is the one alone has lived the perfect life required by all of us. But he doesn't just enter our little world he tells us Zacchaeus just like he tells us come down from the tree because Zacchaeus I invite you to come down from the tree because I am going to Jerusalem to be hung on a tree I am the one that's going up on a tree so you don't have to I'm going to give my life away as a ransom I'm going to pay your debt I'm not letting you off scot-free. No, I'm going to be judged for all that you've done so that all that I have done perfect, I'm going to give to you, and it's free. It's a gift. How do you receive it? By grace through faith. And for those of us that have placed our trust in Jesus Christ, these elements that are being passed out, the bread and the cup are a picture. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, can I just encourage you with something? Don't be distracted about, what do I do? Do I need to take the drink? Listen, you can just let those elements pass by. And I just want you to ponder this. Is he calling your name? You don't need to do anything. But would you receive him? Would you be willing as we're preparing our hearts just to say, Jesus, I'm not even sure I know who you are, but this guy was up on the stage and he was reading your word. And there's a story about you said the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And could that mean you would do that for me? Because the answer is, Absolutely.